Hello and welcome to 5 Inch Floppy on GameArena.com.au. I'm Junglist, and we've been spending an embarrassing amount of time in Diablo 3. So much so that we kind of have to now cover what will go down as the most hyped game of 2012. To give you an idea how hyped it is, it's one of those cultural phenomenons where jokes are being told that aren't exactly funny, but they're celebrated because they have something to do with Diablo. Games news sites are putting up stories that aren't exactly interesting, but they get lots of clicks because they have something to do with Diablo. People who normally wouldn't be caught dead playing a video game or doing anything nerdy will play Diablo. And it doesn't just come down to fanboyism, it's the guarantee that goes along with the Blizzard name. There's all those months of crunch, the effort that goes into every single event, the years spent building up a reputation that allowed them to release a game when they feel it's finished. To the average gamer, that doesn't matter. All that matters is Blizzard. When you see that name, you know you've got a good game. Diablo 3 is a game all about charging into battle with six abilities and using them over and over. Your classes for this outing are the Barbarian, the Monk, the Witch Doctor, the Demon Hunter, and the Wizard. We went with the African Voodoo Master, whose combat philosophy is walk softly and carry a big jar of spiders. Intentionally or not, the Witch Doctor class is based around the Soul Harvest ability. You don't have to use it, but you'd be a fool not to. But you don't have to, but you'd be a fool not to. You don't have to, but... Simply put, it more than doubles the damage of all abilities and pets. So you don't have to use it, but you'd be a fool not to. And when applied to your AoE abilities, well, that's where 10 seconds of unedited ownage comes in. You may have escaped us at the Kasim outpost, but now you will die. I don't want to say the Witch Doctor is OP, but when I started using Soul Harvest, Diablo the game typed GG. Soul Harvest lasts for 30 seconds, but the cooldown is 15 seconds. So as long as you keep hitting it in this little window here, you'll never lose that extra power. It's an optimum upkeep ability. There's no decision making around it, you just do it. If you choose not to upkeep, you won't die. You just won't run at optimum efficiency. The fun comes from when other abilities need to be casted as well, and you have to fit them elsewhere in that 30 second window. It's a type of time management gameplay that appeals to those people who just can't help trying to run their lives more efficiently. There's a satisfaction that comes with tweaking a system that works and using it over and over. It's actually not as much of a carrot on a stick game as we thought it would be. Opening up the runes and abilities to be changed at any time means as soon as you get bored or think you figured it out, you can change. Only problem is, if you actually have got it figured out, there's no reason to change in terms of damage output, so you're really only doing it for the fancy new effects. Even if you haven't discovered the ideal combo, you might feel like you have because enemies fold quicker than origami in Diablo 3 right up until the end. Combine that with co-op and you steamroll right through enemies. It's almost a joke. Diablo 3 is a game suffocating in its own ease. And just to be sure, we beat the game a second time with a monk, a class that carries around a weapon until combat starts when he puts it away. And then we realized it's not the witch doctor or the monk that's OP. Diablo's UP! It's UP! Blizzard apologists will say that the real game starts on the harder difficulty settings. This is a cop-out. This is like World of Warcraft players saying the real game starts when you start raiding. I got news for you. The real game starts when you press the play button. And it's not helped by the fact that it doesn't let you play the harder difficulty settings until you've beat normal. Also not helping things is a below average story, which is okay if you walk into every video game expecting that, but call me crazy, I was expecting better from Blizzard. They really dropped the ball on this one. That makes me think of the drowned temple near the festering woods. I remember you telling me about it, Uncle. Exactly, Leia. The temple was home to the Nephilim. The first half of the game crawls at a frustrating pace, and going through the same zones and killing the same bosses as Diablo 2 makes this feel more like a reboot than a sequel. You'll still pass through some interesting environments, and many of them dark and gruesome, but the only thing demanding mental energy is playing around with your character. This was one of Blizzard's few good decisions. You can switch around abilities at any time, and instead of advancing down a talent tree, you pick one rune to enhance an ability. These runes aren't so much better than each other as different. For our Witch Doctor, just about every ability had an option for lifesteal or slow. 
mana steel, more pets, or wider area effect. Whatever build you go for with these runes, the end result is the same. There's just different ways of getting there. Whether it's a lifesteal build, mana steel, pet build, AoE, slow and snare, or something else, there might be different pretty effects on the screen, but all result in the enemy dying after a few clicks. One thing's for certain, you'll have plenty of time to try out new builds before you get to the Winter Fortress when things start to get good. This area here, it's what games like this are all about. Isn't this what we want from a game like this? Lots of enemies on screen at once to pummel. It's not only technically impressive, but all of a sudden, it's not so bad that it's so easy. Demolishing whole armies feels good. Similarly, what you want from a necro class is being able to raise a small army, like dogs, zombies, pygmies, and later ghosts and spiders. We expected to criticize Diablo for wasting your time with manipulative mechanics, more concerned with keeping you playing and hopefully using the delayed real money auction house, rather than making you have fun. Not so. The large numbers of enemies to click through and different spell effects make for some great eye candy from about halfway through the game onward. There was one thing though we just can't forgive. No doubt you would have heard by now about the troubles that people are having connecting to the servers troubles that persist, so we won't go on too much about the launch debacle. But the decision to make you connect to Blizzard servers constantly to play the game is ridiculous. Not only are you connected to the servers, but you're actually sending your signal to the Blizzard server and back. Now I know that we have some international viewers of this show, so pardon me for a moment if I take an exclusively Australian perspective. Blizzard, can I direct your attention to this? Down at the bottom of the screen, there you go. What's that? Is that lag in my single player game? Yeah, yeah it is. What the hell? We had one night where we had a consistent 950 ping. Extremely frustrating when you're in a boss fight that demands quick reaction speed to avoid his attacks. Guys, you're killing us. And that brings us to Endgame. There's a lot in Diablo 3 that we don't agree with, but we still had a lot of fun tinkering with our character and blasting through hordes of easy peasy enemies. It says something about the trust in the developer that so many people are willing to put up with so much just to play their game. But don't push it, Blizzard. Nothing lasts forever.